in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us.
Bible, there's this group of people called the prophets. Have you ever heard us talk about the prophets? And like one of the things that they do is they'll sometimes say, this is what's going to happen tomorrow. They call that prophecy. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? So like in the Christmas story, we read, we read like from the prophet Isaiah sometimes because the prophet Isaiah says, the people have walked in darkness, but they have seen this great light. And a child is born unto us, and we shall call him Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God. Does that sound familiar? You, you've heard us read that a lot, right? And there's another time that Isaiah said a, a root will grow up out of the, uh, a branch will grow up out of the root of Jesse, saying that, that Jesus, when he comes, is going to be you know, a descendant of King David, and stuff like that. In our story today that we're going to read um, for the sermon today, Matthew uh, talks about what Hosea says, out of Egypt shall, shall uh, my, my son will come. Um, so it's kind of interesting, isn't it? So I was just wondering, um, can y'all prophesy? Like, can you tell me what's going to happen tomorrow? No? Are you sure? I bet you could. You could tell me what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, I, I brought a crystal ball. I know there's a risky thing to do because we don't really believe in crystal balls, but I have one. And so, if crystal ball will show you what's going to happen tomorrow. It'll tell the future. Right? Isn't that what a crystal ball does? So I thought we could look into the crystal ball and see what's going to happen tomorrow. That'd be cool. Okay, I think, I think you're supposed to kind of wave your hand over and then you just lift the covering. And then I think with this kind of crystal ball, you shake it. So, based on this one, what could we say is going to happen tomorrow? Something that would be really cool. I don't think it's going to happen since it's like Florida today. Santa's on vacation now. But Santa's on a horse. Um, I don't think Santa rode a horse, but he's on like a merry-go-round thing. But what, what, what would this crystal ball tell us it's going to do tomorrow? It's going to snow. Would that be? What? No, it's not. <laughs> but we could say that Santa's leaving on the horse, except that his bag is full of presents. So you know this really isn't a crystal ball. This is just a cool Santa snow globe, right? But as I thought about this whole idea of the prophets telling us what it's going to be like in the future, help us to expect what's coming, I thought, you know, it, it might be that we can do that. And as I thought about this bag of gifts and how we probably got some gifts. Um, we like sharing gifts with each other at this time of the year, that Jesus is a gift from God to us. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Remember the angels singing stuff that Jesus is going to save us and make dark things light and bad things beautiful, and that we become beautiful people because of what God's done for us in Jesus. Right? That's kind of the, at the heart of the story. So we are the living body of Christ. Have you ever heard us? Talk about being the living body of Christ. Like that's our mission statement. We want to follow Jesus and to be just like him. So as I thought about that, then we become God's gift to the world, don't we? So that when we go from here, if we are following Jesus and we're just like Jesus, what are some of the things that are going to happen? Hmm? You don't want to be a boy. I don't want you to either. But you know, we're all created in God's image. So there's something of God in us. And so if, if we're like Jesus, we're going to be kind. We're going to be friendly. Right? What else, what else would it be like if we left here just like Jesus? We bring peace to others. And you remember when, when somebody asked Jesus, what does God want more than anything? He said, love God and love your neighbor. So I think that we could be like prophets. We could like tell somebody what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen tomorrow. I know what's going to happen tomorrow. You do too? You want to give it a go? Your brother's birthday. That's awesome. <laughs> See, so we know some things that are going to happen tomorrow. But listen, I know, I know that if you, the three of you, and any of the rest of us in this room, will follow Jesus tomorrow, then our neighbors are going to feel loved. A hungry person's going to be fed. And somebody's going to smile. 
Isn't that cool? Let's pray together. God, thank you for the prophets who came and sometimes gave us a glimpse, sometimes a warning, but sometimes a word of hope of what's to come, that the world will be met by you, that darkness will meet light, and all things good will happen. And because we're your church, we just pray that our tomorrows uh, will be as beautiful as the today that you make it for us. Help us to be your church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, I think y'all have an option now. You can stay and worship with your family, or you can go to the nursery. Right? Did I get that right? This is just my day job, you know? That's right, isn't it? Now let us stand as we're able for, for our gospel lesson this morning. Our gospel lesson is from Matthew chapter 2, beginning with the 13th verse. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And remain there, there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child and to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled, because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of, of Israel. When they heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after they were warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that when he had been, what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled, he will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I wonder how long they stayed in the barn. Mary and Joseph and the new baby. I think I would have stayed a long time. I love barns. Um, to me, the barns are just kind of a, a warm, fuzzy place. I find myself uh, longing to be in one, the smell of straw, and also that kind of strange, sweet smell of cow manure. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's that barn smell that really shouldn't smell nice at all and the tools that are everywhere. I remember standing in my granddaddy's barn and just looking at the tools, some of them that I would use to help him on the farm. Uh, they, were, they were weathered and, and marked by life on the farm. Uh, the best barns have an old tractor. You know, I don't remember much from week to week, but I, after two and a half years, I'm sure I've certainly said something about my dream to, to build a barn. Uh, I have a dream to, to build a barn. And I can see it in my mind, uh, the shape that I want it to be. Um, as the years pass, the, the idea of the barn gets bigger and bigger. I think it needs to be bigger and bigger. <laughs> I'll be driving along some country road and I'll see s uh, s some barn that looks kind of like uh, what I have in mind. Um, and I know maybe as the day gets closer when I'm actually going to build this barn that I'll have the courage to stop and ask the owner if I could just walk through it um, and get some more ideas for, for what's coming. Um, so I want to build this barn and I just want to hang out there, just be in it. Maybe after uh, just a good day of hard work to sit in the doorway of the barn, just sit there and watch the corn grow. 
Everybody dreams that, right? Y'all are dreaming something similar. I, I think the part that throws me sometimes about the nativity scene is that I have this, this general sense that it's all good, this warm, fuzzy. And maybe that's because I grew up in the church. The nativity scene was on the coffee table, it was on the countertop, maybe it was over the fireplace on the mantel, rehearsed in the church Christmas plays. But there's always the sense of Joseph and Mary are next to each other, and there's this loving gaze down on the manger. And there's a cow, which means there was cow manure, so there would be that sweet smell in the barn. The cattle would be gently lowing, there would be some sheep. It's just a, co it's a cozy thing, a warm fuzzy. And the shepherds are there and they tell the amazing stories. I, I think they would probably be some pretty neat uh, people to get to know. But the Christmas scene, it might look good on my coffee table or over the mantle, but Mary and Joseph actually had a, a rough time. It wasn't that warm and fuzzy. Today's story from Matthew is about what happens when they leave the barn. So we move from shepherds and wise men, from the glory to God in the highest, from the, the bright angel choir and the bright star in the sky, uh, to a flee for your life warning. And so they do. In the middle of the night, even. It's, it's a frightening thing. It's a different scene now. And as the, the story of, of Christmas continues to unfold, we begin to see what it actually looks like for the light to threaten the darkness. Now Herod uh, is historically known as a dark person. He had a lot of issues. There was a lot of paranoia, a lot of uh, perceived threats, but certainly talk of, of a future king was an obvious threat to his grip on power. And so it's a, it's a gruesome story that Becky read uh, from us from the gospel. The violence that unfolds is hard for us to imagine um, and maybe even harder to understand or explain, uh, certainly theologically. The religious community was also uneasy. And we pick that up even in these early stories. There were a lot of questions around Jesus' birth. Maybe there was an air of excitement. Could this be what's coming? These stories that we're hearing. But certainly as Jesus grew into a man and began his ministry, uh, maybe the, the questions actually uh, increased. There were even more of them. But Jesus pushed against the norm. He, he pushed against those boundaries that maybe were there because of the traditions that were there because of the law. Matthew understands Jesus in a specific way. When you read Matthew's gospel, his telling of the story, there's a very clear sense of, of connecting Jesus to Moses. Jesus is like the new Moses. And so he has a, a, a habit in his writing to make a historical connection. So there's consistently this fulfilling of scripture. The prophet said this was going to happen and, and so on. So Jesus as the new Moses was, was this uh, bringer, this new and, and final lawgiver. And so Matthew quotes Hosea in our story. Out of Egypt I have called my son. And so to the Jewish person for sure there was this very distinct connection to that event that, that marked their existence as a people, deliverance from slavery and, and bondage. The law that Jesus would bring. You know, we talk about this a lot because Jesus answered the question in, in such a huge way. You know, that question like, well, what is the law that God wants us to abide by? What is God's greatest commandment? And, and he, Jesus follows up his answer with kind of those, that, that statement that makes it so significant when he says all of the law and all of the prophets hang on these two things. That God's great desire for us and great commandment, the great law is to love God with all that you are and to love your neighbor as yourself. 
And I think it's significant for us to, to catch the fact that it was Jesus' love for people that brought about his demise and ultimately our salvation. And so as I, be, as I began to think about that and, and think about some examples of, of uh, Jesus' life that, that illustrated that, I immediately thought of uh, kind of when his ministry began, when he first started, and he went home. And Luke tells the story of when he goes home to Nazareth. And on the Sabbath day, he goes into the synagogue and he opens the scroll. And as the rabbi, he had the privilege, uh, at least on that day, the privilege of reading from the Isaiah scroll. And he read uh, from the Isaiah scroll that was designated for that day. And then he rolls up the scroll and he sits down and he begins to teach the synagogue. And what he says after he sits down is he tells them, this, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing today. Well, that raised some questions. The primary one being, um, isn't this Joseph's boy? <laughs> That's what they said. Isn't this Joseph's boy? So how can this be? And so Jesus uh, says a little more. <laughs> and it disturbs them. He, he says, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown but the truth is, there were many, many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet, Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And then he said, there were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And maybe you remember this story. They became so enraged in the synagogue that they drug him out of the synagogue and literally tried to kill him. Because what Jesus had done was he had challenged their sense of nationalism. You know, their, their understanding were people like this were to be judged by God. They would be condemned and ultimately destroyed by God. And here Jesus is lifting them up as examples of people that are included in God's embrace. Like the outsiders are also insiders. And then Luke continues to tell these stories. You know, I immediately thought of Sabbath stories. We think of those when we think about Jesus kind of pushing the norm, pushing the boundaries, and pushing back against the religious establishment. He was constantly doing things on the Sabbath day that got him in trouble. So there was a man with a, a withered hand and, and uh, he healed him. And religious people were on the fringes actually watching and, and waiting to see what he would do. And so we're familiar with his words to them when he would say something like, well, you lift your animal out of the ditch on the Sabbath day. Something like, how much of, of how much more value is a, is a human being than, than an ox? Shouldn't we show the same kind of compassion and love and, and care? And then there's a story that's really awkward. Jesus has been invited to dinner by, by one of the religious leaders, by a Pharisee. And so, so it's, a, it's a religious group around the table. And Luke tells this story too. And he doesn't tell us much about the woman, but he says this woman from the city comes into the dinner. And he says this woman was a sinner. And that was a tag put on someone whose um, maybe choices that would have been considered a mistake were publicly known. And that would mean that they were probably not welcome in the synagogue. They'd, they'd maybe have to sneak in unnoticed because it wouldn't be welcome because they were a sinner. We don't know if she was a prostitute. We don't know what she did. But we do know that she walked into this dinner party and she stood behind Jesus and she began weeping. And she had this alabaster jar of ointment. And Luke says that, that she began to anoint Jesus with this oil. And weeping on his feet, she starts kissing his feet. And that's kind of awkward. <laughs> it was certainly awkward for the people at the table. And they began to question uh, Jesus' I don't know, authority, validity. If this really is a prophet from God, if this really is the one who's to come, he would know exactly who she is. And if he knew it's if he knew who she was, there's no way that he would let her touch him like this. That's what they said. He can't be who we think he is because he's allowing a sinner to touch him. 
And then Jesus kind of puts them in a tailspin when he looks to this woman and he says, your sins are forgiven. And so the question becomes, who is this that thinks he can forgive sins? And there are other stories that we can remember. But what these tell us is that for Jesus, people matter. And reconciliation matters. Forgiveness matters. So that on Christmas Eve, when, when John, you know, says that the Word became flesh and, and lived among us, full of grace and truth, it was an anticipation of these stories that we experienced. Jesus was the embodiment of God's grace. Out of Egypt I have called my son. And out of Egypt there's freedom. So I got to thinking about today, this is the last Sunday of 2019. We're coming out of 2019 and barreling into 2020. I don't know what your habits are at the end of the year. I think a, a good one to, to have in these days is, is to remember the year that we've just lived. And so I've been doing that. And so I thought about 2019, our life together in particular. And in starting with January, you know, we anticipated trouble. We, we could see coming this, this possibility of, of our denomination, our church that we love, splintering and dividing knowing that we ourselves disagree and are in different places. And I was really proud of us because we decided to just sit around tables in our disagreement with this understanding that until I know you and understand you, I can't truly love you. Trying to get at this place where we can radically disagree on something and still be God's people together. And then of course, Pancake Day. We've talked about Pancake Day a lot um, but this year, I think it was year 63, for those of you who are visiting with us, the Pancake Day fundraiser that raises thousands and thousands of dollars. The Pancake Day committee said, you know what, if we make this free, uh, we bet more people will come. And so they made Pancake Day free. And those of you who were part of working, I don't know, roughly 6 in the morning until 7 or 8 in the evening, uh, you witnessed something pretty phenomenal. And in our... In our uh, family Life Center in the gym there, it was just full of people and it seemed like it was all people. There were thousands of people who came and got free pancakes, but they got a, a little taste of something more. Uh, God was close that day. And the hard part of that day was the very same day in St. Louis, our denomination um, closed the door and it was hard, it was painful. When I think about this summer, usually when I think about summer, I always remember the, the respite and renewal that comes with a trip to the beach with family and the sand and the fishing and all that comes with that. But you know, the summer kicked off for me this year. You as a congregation allowed me to go on the youth mission trips. And so I started the summer by going with the, the middle school youth group on their mission trip. And I kind of wear that as a badge of courage that I was brave enough to go on the middle school mission trip. I actually really wasn't afraid, but I was very proud of what I experienced. Not only did they mostly love each other <laughs> and get along with each other, but our middle schoolers built two amazing decks. They worked so hard and the work that they did, they took pride in it. And it literally blew my mind. In this trailer park, these two decks. But you know what, what really caught my attention and made me love them the most? is the people who lived there, they loved them instinctively. Knee-jerk reaction was, of course I'll come inside and have some lemonade. Of course I'll come in and visit and meet the parrot. I went to Pittsburgh with the senior high group and I was also amazed because senior highs, they're senior highs. <laughs> High schoolers have an agenda. They have their driver's license. They have friends. They have stuff to do. They have jobs to work. And yet here was a large group of senior high kids who gave up a week of their life to work really hard. Not always a clean job. And it was amazing. I think probably one of the things that, I'm proud of all of those things, but um, the way that we ended our year, uh, Thanksgiving, you know, the downtown churches pushed back on a long-held tradition. 
And there's a little bit of revel in me that got me excited about, yeah, let's break the tradition. <laughs> but it was, it was a big deal. For I don't know how many years, if not decades, the downtown churches, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, have had a worship service together. And so the, someone preaches, usually it's the newest kid in town gets the, the, the joy of preaching the Thanksgiving sermon, and one of the other churches will host. And all the, the, the music directors from the different churches will gather their choirs and they'll work on songs. And there's this energy put into um, a worship service together. The energy for this waned a little bit and we felt it. And I think it was because the attendance had been dropping. So the people who were coming were, of course, the clergy who were involved, um, the choir directors of the choirs, and maybe a handful of people from, from the congregations. And so there was this sense of, ah, uh, you know, it happens sometimes with tradition. Someone tossed an idea in the room. And the idea was, what if the downtown churches fed the community together? And the energy literally blew the roof off the room. And leaders from the congregations involved were excited about this opportunity. And many of you were there, and we hosted it. First Baptist Church is planning to host it next year. And our Family Life Center was cut in half on one half of it. People who had been waiting outside the door maybe an hour and a half to get in were eating homemade chili and cornbread. All the churches brought crock pots and cooked and our, our staff did an amazing job of, of coordinating a lot of this and doing a lot of the work, just eating a hot meal. And on the other side of the gym, the man of food bank uh, brought their pop-up market and it was just all this food that they could literally go shopping. And there were fresh vegetables, the colors, it just looked like I was walking into the grocery store. And we counted, you know, Methodists love to count things. And so we counted how many people came through the door and I think it was approaching 200 but another question that was asked each person was with this food that you're taking today how many how many uh, in your home is this going to feed and I don't know what the exact number is I've heard 600 500 400 we also like to exaggerate numbers I think so somewhere I think between four and five hundred people were impacted and had food because the churches came together On Christmas Eve, our little candles, the fire in our little candles came from the Christ candle. You know, I, I love the, the Christmas Eve candlelight communion service. It's a, it's a warm fuzzy for me. And maybe that goes back to my childhood too. I remember being six years old and standing in Martin's Chapel, United Methodist Church with a little candle. I actually got to, to hold one, which is probably not a good idea, but... <laughs> I think it is a warm fuzzy. It's like being in a barn together. And you know, we need that. We need to know something of God's love. We need to know that there's hope. We, we need to know that God is saying from the very beginning, I am in this with you. Because God is. On Christmas Eve, we left the barn and we went out into the dark with a flicker of light and some hope. So now what? That's actually my question. It's the question I'm asking myself on the last Sunday of 2019 and I just thought I'd bring it into the pulpit today. So now what? I wonder what threatens us. Is God warning us to flee from something? From some danger? I think God does. Is God calling us to run toward something? I, I find myself wondering as your pastor... How are we to threaten the world? How are you and I to threaten the world's order of things? I think one of the, the, the biggest mistakes that the church often makes in the interpretation of this Christmas story 
is that we make it this private, personal thing. That I need to make room in the manger of my heart and accept Jesus. That it's this, this personal commitment. And it is. It's a personal thing for sure. We celebrated baptism this morning and Cora Mae is four months old. But the day is coming when she will stand before us and she will answer for herself the questions that her parents, Jared and Kelsey, answered for her this morning and that the congregation answered for her. It's a personal commitment, but it's a personal commitment not only to Christ, but to the group. It's a group thing. Today's story reminds us that it's not only a group hug, but it's a group battle. And because we are the living body of Christ, you and I should be a threat. We should be a threat to poverty and to homelessness and to loneliness and to injustice and hatred and prejudice and violence and greed. And so that's my prayer today. On this side of Christmas, as 2020 is fast approaching, that God will help us with that. To know that we need to sit in the barn door and watch the corn grow, but that we can't stay there. We've got stuff to do. Thanks be to God.
us go to God in prayer. Gracious and most merciful God, we give you thanks for the ways in which you have walked alongside of us, among us, and within us this year. As we consider and look back on the year 2019, we each individually and as family units can remember great times, great times of rejoicing and warm, fuzzy feelings, we also remember times of great sorrow and grief and difficulty and times in which we weren't sure where to turn next. We remember those things also within the context of the, of the life of our church. Times in which we clung to you as our faith and as our leader. Times in which we celebrated and rejoiced. Times in which we were sorrowed and were made to grieve as a community. We give you thanks for the ways in which you have continued to lead us and to guide us. We thank you that we have never been alone and that your Holy Spirit has been there to provide comfort and to guide, to guide us, to make sure that we know that you are with us and that you are leading us as a church. We give you thanks for those moments in which we have come together as a community to reach across our denominational lines, to acknowledge your common birth in you, to acknowledge our church and the body of Christ is extended beyond our local congregation. We pray that there will be more events like those in this past November where we all come together for a common purpose to feed the hungry and to love on those who are our neighbors. May you continue to lead us as a church in 2020 to embrace those things in which we need to, to guide us when we are fearful and we don't know what the days, lie, the days are ahead of us will be like. We also ask that you would continue to guide us as a church as we hope to be your living body of Christ. And sometimes that means ruffling feathers and sometimes that means going outside of the norm. We pray that we will always be walking in step with you, leaning on you and your word to guide us. We pray for those needs in our church, for those we've mentioned today, those whose health is failing and for their families, those who continue to recover from difficult treatments and from difficult health problems and from the, for those surgeries that have been difficult to heal from. We pray also for the Phelps family at this time of poignant grief and for the many other ways in which we cling to you and, and leave burdens at your feet this morning. We thank you that you are God who has ears to hear and we ask that we would offer up to you today the words of our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. This time we invite the ushers forward to receive our tithes and offerings.
gracious God, we give you great thanks for the many blessings that we have received. May we also return to you ourselves and everything that we have so that we might be used for your glory and all that we have might be used for your kingdom. It's the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.